good afternoon, everyone. I'm really excited to be moderating this panel. Um, I'm not actually listed on the program as the moderator, but I'm Kirsten Oster, and I am moderating so that Warren can spend more time talking about the program he's working on and everyone else on the panel can too. So um, I, I just wanted to say briefly, in case anyone wasn't here this morning, Larry made an announcement about a new program that Medicine X is developing this year and for the conference next year called MedX Academy, and it's going to include a focus on education. And he talked about the importance of really bringing all of the changes that are occurring in the world around medicine into the training of doctors so that they can actually really practice in the world that, um, that they're going to emerge from medical school in. So that's really the focus of this panel, is thinking about what doctors need to learn to be practicing doctors in the future, and to do that in a kind of really robust way, not just sort of cobbling things together kind of way. And all four of our panelists have, um, have gone ahead and just developed innovative courses at their individual institutions that are trying to address some of the big problems they see in the curriculum. So that's what they're gonna talk about, and then we'll get into some of the issues and opportunities and challenges that they've faced along the way. So to start off, I'd like to have each of you just talk a little bit about who you are and why you ended up creating the program you did, and tell us a little bit about what it is. Kyra. Sure. So. Um, I came from a corporate executive position uh, for about four years. I saw many, many companies pitch to me on, oh, we're going to get, we're going to pitch this to doctors. We're going to get doctors, you know, involved. Um, this was an insurance company, so I also saw a lot of efforts to, you know, create network uh, collaborations. ACOs were starting, all that kind of stuff. And some of the fantasies that I heard were. Oh yeah, doctors will prescribe apps, and they'll you know th they'll work this uh, into their you know, enterprise software, and Epic's going to join along. And I'm like, oh wow, you know, like this this is really, really just far away from where medical education is. So uh, when I came to Stanford, I really had this vision for a patient engagement course. And it just so happens that people kept saying, well, you need to talk to Larry Chu. You need to talk to Larry Chu. And like, I, I have this three hit theory where if somebody says something three times, whether it's a book or a movie or a person, I have to meet them or I have to go to that movie. Um, so I reached out and he was, I think, typing um, a summary or something. He was writing a description of a class he wanted to do on patient empowerment. And so we just basically did a Reese's Pieces kind of, or, you know, peanut butter and chocolate kind of thing, and we mashed them together, and we did Engage and Empower Me in January of this year. And it really is um, such a passion for both of us to change medical education in a way that prepares physicians for the role that I think they're going to play, which is the emotional intelligence that weaves all of the technology together and overrides some of the clinical algorithms that doctors have carried in their heads alone for a very long time, um, and really, puts them in the, in the place of proper leadership and proper uh, monitoring of the entire you know, situation. And, and mostly, I think, physicians are not trained about behavior change or how to uh, help a patient along a continuum and to come back from relapsing of their own behavior change and falling off of that. Thanks. Amin. My name is Amin Azam. I have the great honor of being on faculty at University of California, San Francisco, and UC Berkeley. Um, our course started with my listening to the wisdom of a medical student who said, look, we all look at Wikipedia first for any information we want or need, um, uh, and all of you faculty tell us to, you're poo-pooing Wikipedia and you tell us not to go there. Why don't we get busy improving it? And uh, so I listened to the wisdom of that student and in partnership with other faculty at UCSF um, created this elective for fourth year med students to be editing Wikipedia for academic credit. In our case, the students um, uh, partner with the volunteer community called Wiki Project Medicine, so the uh, all volunteer workforce that are dedicated to improving the quality of medical information on Wikipedia. Um, and Wiki Project Medicine partners with Translators Without Borders to translate that to other languages in the world. And they also partner with Wikipedia Zero, which is a an effort to make access to Wikipedia available for free in the world. Uh, we heard yesterday about cell phone penetrance upwards of 95%. And so when I heard about how all these things fit together, it just to me felt like an amazing opportunity to help our students make a bigger difference in the world. It's an elective that we've run 
It's a month-long elective for fourth-year medical students. We've run it twice last academic year, and we'll run it once more again this year. So for me, I think it's this realization that, like you said, sort of a, this is the world our students are, are graduating into, and very much want them to be digital contributors and not merely digital consumers. That's great. Thank you. Brian. Um, yeah, I'm playing off that. Um, I, my name is Brian Vardabedian. I am a faculty member at Baylor College of Medicine, and I run a curriculum called Digital Smarts. Um, and it, it really kind of got started with the idea that uh, for the first time we're seeing, uh, or for the first time medical educators are facing the fact that um, digital natives are appearing on the wards with their smartphones and their appliances, and yet uh, while they're quite accustomed to, you know, living uh, in real time and whatnot, that's oftentimes at odds with what happens on the clinical ward, right? And so um, we said we needed more than just a 30-minute orientation for medical students, and so we created a, a Digital Smarts, which is a longitudinal curriculum which helps uh, students really deal with their professional life in the public space. Um, and so we, we, with great support from Baylor College of Medicine, we have uh, dedicated time um, at the start of medical school, uh, immediately preclinical, uh, and during the fourth year, just as they're about to leave, and um, we take uh, early on. We uh, using group-based learning. We uh, cover all the issues you know surrounding mitigation of risk um, very early on, and uh, later on in the program, uh, we kind of focus on the opportunity that social media provides, such as personal learning networks and what have you. Uh, what's important about it is the information that there's, there our students get is really contextual. Uh, for example, you know, teaching a medical student about smartphone use at orientation doesn't help them, but it, uh, right before they're about to go on the wards, it's really helpful. Or talking about starting a LinkedIn page or improving your digital footprint doesn't help a student at their first year because they're not focused on leaving. And uh, we've had great success our first year, and we're excited about it. Great, thank you, and Warren. Great, so um, I'm a faculty over at UC Irvine. I'm one of the associate deans for instructional technologies, and we um, started a program in 2010 where we gave iPads to each incoming student, and one of the things that we found was they actually were pretty decent at the technology itself, but as sort of everyone alluded to, the, the context for the technology wasn't quite there. And for me, it didn't really click until I was, I was actually here at, um, the Stanford Summit prior to one of the Medicine 2.0 conferences, and my mind was just completely blown. Like, I had no idea about a lot of these things that existed, and I thought myself relatively tech savvy as a faculty member and physician. I thought, if I don't even have any concept of this, our students definitely don't. And so because of that, we started putting together sort of a curriculum pulled from uh, role models that I found, such as Brian, actually, that I met at a conference on things like social media, uh, what e-patients were, and wearables, and all these sort of new trends that I thought were going to be a very big part, and actually are becoming a big part of medicine, that it, I felt our students had to be exposed to. And so we developed this uh, elective curriculum um, to move forward through our, our, our medical school, and we we're going to be starting our third year of putting this together in sort of a, a mishmash fashion just to, to get it out there to our students. Great, thank you. So um, I want to mention for everyone here and watching from afar that I believe the links to web sites for all of these different programs have been sent out on Twitter. Julie Yume, I think, may have sent out those links, yes? Excellent, okay, great. So um, you know, follow the MedEx um, Twitter feed and you should be able to find these, these um, sites when you're ready to look for them. Okay, so you've got a sense of the, of the kinds of innovative experiments that, that these folks have developed, um, but one of the things that we've heard already is um, that there isn't actually an established structured space in the medical school curriculum for these kinds of projects. So a big question that a lot of people have is how did you actually get this going? How, how did you succeed in teaching this course as a medical school course? So anyone who wants to jump in. I'll go ahead and go first. Yeah. Um, in, in our case, um, we thought about putting it into the required curriculum, but as I think you're alluding to, the, it's already chock full of a lot of other required content. It seems hard to, if you add something, what else do you have to take away? It's really, really hard to convince people to t take stuff out of medical school. So we, we decided to shoot for a fourth year elective, and that way the early adapter students that were interested in it would prioritize the content. Um, that's how we've been able to do it. Uh, I hear, look to hear it from others, too. 
Mm -hmm. So I, I was pretty lucky in that uh, at Baylor we had the strong support of Dr. Paul Klotman, who's our president, and so mm -hmm. it was uh, a mandate, I think, based upon um, the fact that this is what part of what students have to learn. And so, um, you know, we, we, we were able to get into the curriculum pretty easily that way, and we put in some transition points in between periods. Mm -hmm. Uh, for us, we found enough sort of touch points within the curriculum that it's still an elective. It's not for credit, so students um, aren't required to take it, but there's enough touch points within what we do with technology that we get them before they start their first year, um, sometimes during lunch and evenings throughout their first and second year, before their third year and before they graduate, um, but it's still not really truly structured. It's sort of a, a collection of, of lectures that sort of follow a theme and engagements that follow a theme, um, but for, for right now, that's the, the big dilemma that you know, what do you take out to put this in, and, and how do you show them what that value is? And I will say that despite the support that we had from our president of Baylor, it still was a challenge for our curriculum dean because there's only so much room on the shelf, right? And so, um, but I do think that it was seen as a pretty important thing, and so they were able to, to get it in there. Mm -hmm. What about you, Kyra? Did you find any difficulty there? Well, um, from my perspective, it was magical because I didn't have to do anything, and I would just say three words, Dr. Larry Chu. Uh -huh. um, and, oh. and so he could probably tell you how difficult it was or not. Um, I know there were some hoops he had to jump through. And I think the thing that was interesting is that we thought it would be for medical students, but it actually turned out to be a very diverse group of students, um, very few of whom were medical students. And I think one of the, th the problems with this is that medical students are so slammed that you know th they're hedging, you know, if you, if you require in-person uh, attendance, for example, which is what we need to do our class, they're going to avoid your class. So we did have some who were kind of forward thinking. And my thing is, you know, they don't see what's coming uh, down the line. You know, four years from now, they can't predict what is going to change, uh, what's going to impact them in terms of, you know, in engagement of patients, delivering in, in within an ACO, those kinds of dynamics that are going to change the culture of medicine and the, and the pressure on the provider. And so I think we have to be somewhat uh, you know, forward seeking or forward thinking for them, and I think that's what we all share is this. You know, oh, you're going to be a, up, you know, a up against this. And we want to prevent that from. Uh, we want to give you an advantage and prevent you from uh, being behind when you get there. The challenge we, I mean, one of the challenges we're facing now is we're asking some really big questions like what, what does a doctor really need to know, 20 years from now? We're talking to all these separate things, and it's like, does a doctor need to know how to send a tweet? It's like, well. I mean, you know, is it is it platform specific, or there there are general principles they need to know. So when the next platform comes out, and so this is a real challenge we're facing. And I think nationally, in terms of curriculum, that this is a something we're facing. We've talked about that, Warren. Right, and I think the one of the parts is if you if you look at sort of all of our respective positions, you know, nothing against the positions that we have within our universities, we aren't necessarily the decision makers that right. sort of make these rules happen. And I think these are a lot of variables that no one quite knows. And our students, we, I can't expect them to have that context. They're just really focused on learning the core parts of medicine so they don't cause harm first and foremost. But to understand these complex issues, which I think a lot of our leadership don't understand, and I think it's kind of evident from what we've talked about here that there's a lot of leadership that should be attending these kind of conferences to understand better what the bigger picture is. I mean, I see you nodding your head. Did you want to add to that? I mean, I think that it's sort of uh, if we can uh, demonstrate, as all four of us have hopefully done so far, that these elective type courses are successful, that students are drawn to them. This is what our young people, our future doctors, want to engage in thinking about while they're still in training. Then hopefully the 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 rest of the medical schools will follow suit and then embed it into required courses. I completely agree with the panelists. Mm -hmm. we, we talked about this beforehand is this whole idea that the students, uh, we think the students kind of already think they know about this sort of stuff, but certainly with regard to public dialogue and social media, I mean, it's a lot of stuff at odds when, with, with health privacy and professionalism. And so that's another hurdle that you face is the students kind of thinking they already, or they know more than you do. I mean, on the one hand, they know a lot about technology, but they don't yet know how to be doctors, right? Yes. Right. Yeah, right. So there's a, I think there's a real um, value to just actually doing it, to just going ahead and doing the experiment so that then you have something you can show to other people who may not really understand what it is that you're actually trying to do. It, it, it can re be very powerful to show a concrete example. Now, I'm wondering, based on what you said, Kyra, if you could say Dr. Larry Chu at all of your medical schools and whether that would actually, you know, be, are those the magic words that open the door? Wouldn't that be great? So um, on that 
that line, though, I, I'd like to ask you if you can talk a little bit more about, uh, several of you mentioned how these courses either do or do not intersect with the existing curriculum, with the core required curriculum. So that, that is a question, and then I think a, an aspect of that question is also what barriers did you encounter along the way in actually, in the actual teaching of the course or in just getting it going? And did, did you see, was there a tension between this sense that there's already so much in the curriculum and the sense that you're coming and saying, I want to add something else. Warren, you want to start? Sure. Um, uh, where, where to begin with that one? So um, I guess some of, the, what, some of the barriers that we had, it's um, the, the lineup is not very deep in a lot of institutions that have this sort of content expertise. <laughs> and we had a lot of ideas and, and a lot of great plans that we had for it, but when it came down to execution, it was myself and a couple of other people that were putting together an entire course that from the top, no one really felt was important. And so you couldn't rely on protected time or those sort of things. And so it's something that you put together. And again, I, I sort of want to make a quick shout out for this audience. Um, in the past two years, I pulled e-patients from the, the MedEx audience to come in and just Skype into sessions so our students could figure out what an e-patient was. And mm -hmm. so um, to, to Britt and to Sarah, if, if you're out there, thank you. Um, because that's, that's huge. And Brian's done, done stuff with us. And we've had our students follow some of Kyra's and Larry's work with their conferences because it's hard for one person to, to do it all. And so just finding people that are like-minded, that's been at least our little workaround to make that happen in our mm -hmm. course. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in terms of uh, digital smarts, it's, you know, it really deals with public dialogue. And so under core, the core competencies of the, you know, the core competencies that linked with communication and professionalism. And so it was able to fit in pretty nicely with um, all the standards of the curriculum. And so we were able to fashion in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing, um, I learned early on is that the, you know these students really don't like listening to lectures and so we quickly adjusted to uh, small group learning and with cases uh, kind of like with ethics um, there are a lot of great social media dilemmas out there and these students just love to engage in debate and dialogue even when we don't have the answers just debating the questions that mm -hmm. they need. Others did you encounter any barriers while you were teaching the course or things that came up that you didn't expect that made it trickier than you thought it would be? Well, we had a um, really interesting uh, influx of community from the you know larger community who wanted <laughs> to attend. So ours became more of a community dialogue around mm -hmm. what is going on in the system. And I think maybe that's an interesting twist on the story because you know there's the direct education of the physicians in the room, undergrad pre-meds who want to go in that direction with their careers, and then people who have been through the system or who are building companies that have to do with care or who have you know, expertise from uh, different uh, consulting firms or you know, we had just everything and everyone. It was like the people have arrived, you know? And um, I really think that that is an open, you know, disseminating seeds kind of model for you know, going forward with this. You know, I see this scaling out across all conversations. You know, what I think is gonna happen to doctors uh, from what I hear at just sort of the national level and the population level and also at the ACO level is that they're going to be more challenged with managerial skills and directing others to give care because they're going to be top rung and then, you know, trickle, you know, th the system is going to settle out to lowest common denominator to deliver the, the thing that needs to be delivered, mm -hmm. you know, so all of this, you know, sort of, um, knowledge that has been historically stored in our brains is going to be scaled out to devices, to algorithms, to all those things. And then the uh, intelligence that's left in the physician will be in a managerial kind of supervisory role um, over all this. But I, I think very few models except for concierge or plastics or something like that will be that sort of direct, you know, 100% practice care um, that's, you know, 10 years, 15 years down the road. Mm -hmm. It gets to the question of what defines a physician and mm -hmm. what are the things that we have to be competent in. That's the challenge we're facing. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, is, this echoes something that um, Dr. Chu brought up this morning, which was the idea, the vision, that bringing Medicine X Academy to this community requires bringing it to 
the whole community. So that community includes doctors, it includes medical students, but it includes nursing students, it includes students in all the other health professions, people, patients, of course, and everyone else who is touched by this network, which is almost everyone. So that's, it's an incredible inclusive vision, but it's also a really big challenge because one of the things that has come up in some of your comments is that uh, it's not just medical students, e even just within medical education, who may need or want this kind of stuff. So ha have, have any of you, um, you had people from a variety of positions in your class. Did any of you find um, attending physicians or other people in your organization saying, oh, you know, we need this too? Did you hear any feedback like that? The thing I would share is um, we're exploring expanding the course to include other health professional students on our campus, so nursing, pharmacy, dentistry, for example. Mm -hmm. um, what I thought was interesting was that a few years back, it would have older physicians w wouldn't admit to using Wikipedia, mm -hmm. um, and we didn't we didn't have <laughs> physicians asking to take the course, but they did say, you know, if you want your students to be editing my content domain of expertise, a neurologist or an ophthalmologist, whatever it was, they would now at least own up to being willing to partner with the students in the editing uh, process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's an interesting kind of, it, it's an educational process as well, but not in a classroom. And you spoke to the fact that the traditional lecture is also not really the model for these kinds of classes too. So it seems that you're talking about, all of you are talking about both innovative content and also innovative methods. Absolutely. I, I mean, if, uh, going back to the faculty issue, uh, when I was discussing this in kind of concept form, everyone said, how can you be teaching this to students when our faculty have absolutely no idea how to use tools of public dialogue. And so one of the extensions ultimately, hopefully, is to extend digital smarts as a, as a, as a uh, campus-wide phenomenon that addresses uh, attendings as well. We do have a pretty strong faculty development program where we've, we've worked with them too. So, you know, harnessing, it's like GME as well. That's another big challenge. How do we harness residents to teach them this sort of thing? You get them at orientation, then they disappear to a surgical residency. It's really hard to, you know, harness faculty, harness uh, uh, residents, uh, so that's been a big challenge too. There is a big evolution in medical school curricula in general, broader to, than all of our courses, and I think the flipped classroom model, for example, the massive open online courses, and I think um, there is going to be a need for a lot of faculty development around how the educators can educate yep. for the current and next generation. Huge issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, the one thing that's interesting, though, is that with the faculty, it seems like they don't even realize that they're missing out on these parts. and. Uh, Brian and I have had a great opportunity for the AAMC, which is the American Association of American Medical Colleges, to put together a social media workshop for faculty and some students that were there. And the faculty got super engaged for the session that we had, but a lot of them came up afterwards and said, I didn't realize that this was happening. I didn't realize that patients used Facebook. I didn't realize this. And we showed them it was actually really simple. The, the big question is what happens after they walked out of the room? Did they follow up with it? Did they go through and do something else? But I think a lot of faculty just, it's not even on their radar. And so yeah. to, when you say, I'm gonna have a faculty development seminar on social media, they're like, uh, I don't need that. So. Yeah, we, we, we cover very practical things like digital footprint, which uh, tends to attract people. And, uh, but there's a huge opportunity for all of us who have skill sets in this area to, to teach our people we're working with. Kyra, did you want to say something? I was just gonna say, look, I, th I think there's a fundamental disruption to what a doctor is, kind of to Brian's point. Right. Um, we used to pride, I, I graduated 20 years ago, we used to pride ourselves on being a fund of knowledge, a walking brain that knew things that other people yeah. didn't and disseminated the, the truth, you know? And I think we're redefining what it means to heal. You know, you partner, you, you, you have empathy, you understand, um, and you leverage the resources of the fund of knowledge that exist outside of yourself in a way that a machine cannot. And so we have to think of it as like, what can't a machine do? Right. What can't a device do? Because that's all yeah. going to be taken over. Exactly. You know, I mean, we're, we're basically travel is. agents, you know, right. and here comes Travelocity. And so what's left? You know, the, the part that the human can do that will never be replaced right. by machines is the heart. So why don't we train physicians to be experts at that? That's the defining question, I think, of our generation is, is what can we do that a, that a machine can't? And that's going to be... And we know that one of the answers to that is engage with patients, right? So let's talk about that a little in relation to the courses that you all have developed in the programs. What was the role of patients in the course? And um, where might you see 
patient in involvement and engagement in the actual program itself evolving? Kyrie, you want to start? Yeah, I'll start with that. So one of the things I feel really grateful for is that um, you know, my instinct when I was going th as a medical student was to care for people and was to uh, listen to them and that kind of thing. And then that kind of quietly got squelched. I mean, I literally got yelled at um, on the wards for that uh, and almost failed a rotation because of it. And, and I got scarred by that, I'll be honest with you. And, um, and Larry Chu brought me back to my truth, which is that it is about the patients. It is about the people receiving care. We are servants. We are, you know, giving something, um, but we are partnering at best. And I was like, oh my God, like how did you retain that through that brutal process that you went through, all that training and, and being a faculty member and all this stuff? Like, so he's a miracle to me in the sense that, you know, he's always like, it's about the patients. The patients need to speak. They need to run the class. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. So he and I stepped back and had the e-patient experts uh, really run the show. And, um, and then that really set a tone within the class for people in the audience, whether they were faculty or community member or a person coming in on, you know, with a walker or whatever, to really feel like it was about them. You know? And so I, I don't know how he does it, but that's, you know, I just kudos to that. And um, I'm hoping that, you know, it's a MOOC now, so I'm hoping that, you know, thousands more people will be like, yeah, that's what I want. That's what I want to see. That's what I'm about, and kind of wake up to that truth. In our case, there, there was no direct patient care contact for our students uh, during the elective. On the other hand, anybody can edit Wikipedia, and anyone can comment on any Wikipedia page. And so our students were virtually engaging with anyone that was interested in those topics of interest. And for example, one of the students worked on an article on cirrhosis. And during the month she was working on cirrhosis, there were 150,000 views of that cirrhosis Wikipedia page. Wow. So when our students realize just how large of a potential impact they could be making, not the one-on-one, -on -one, I want to acknowledge that's extremely important. But when they saw the one-on-many opportunity, then suddenly they were even more engaged with the elective than I had anticipated. And yeah, this one-to-many opportunity that Wendy Sue Swanson talks about is so powerful. And I think you've illustrated that. Um, and with regard to patients in our program, um, obviously the entire program centers around what doctors do on public places uh, with patients. So all of our scenarios involve um, you know, specifically how to address situations when a, a, a non-established patient reaches out to you in a public network, what specifically should you do. Uh, to date, we've not brought patients into our small groups to do that, but that is, I'm sitting on the panel now thinking I need to do that, so. Um. Thanks, Warren. As I sort of mentioned, we, uh, we were able to get uh, Two people, two patients from uh, from here, actually, you know, Britt and and Sarah, and it was just great. I thought for, like I said, I knew nothing about sort of the, the patient movement, participatory medicine. I knew nothing about this before I, I came here the first time, and I thought that's just really a shame. And I have a, I have a, I almost have a responsibility as being an educator, being an associate dean at a medical school, that I need to put this content more than say biochemistry or some other basic principles. I need to put this in front of our students because this is this is their what they're supposed to be doing. They're supposed to be physicians and educators and taking care of patients. That's sort of their end goal. And if they don't get any exposure to it, and I had an opportunity, then I'm sort of failing at my job. Um, and so for, for me, it was really important for them to see that all of this is happening right now without direct medical you know, context or without the system sort of working for these patients a lot of times, and they should sort of see these problems and hear some of these stories of, of the struggles that patients have with our current system. And they're young, they're not jaded yet, hopefully, and this is their chance to hopefully, you know, have that in their mind as they go forward. So. I'm chuckling because we had agreed backstage that if there was controversy, we wanted to, sh to make sure to bring that to the stage. <laughs> yeah. The problem is we're Please. all medical educator innovators, and so we're all pushing that same boundaries in the same direction. You know, I guess to that point, I, wa I really want to say and just, you know, wonder if this is the case. When I was a medical student, we had patients, but they were at the front of the lecture hall being interviewed by a doc their doctor. And the, the power dynamic was very much like us staring at them. And it was like they were specimen number A. Ether dome. You know? Yeah, exactly. And it was... It was like, here's a case, you know, and I actually went to Harvard for um, public, and, and I saw that they used to actually have like a room where there was a patient on a table, and then you'd have like leagues of these people like in floors above, you know, before microphones and things like that, and they'd all be staring down at this human being, you know, as a specimen. And so I just, I got, you know, that's different. 
that's different than what needs to happen, which is, you know, giving them the mic and, and giving them the power and giving them, and not them, us, like, you know, just breaking down all those barriers and stop, you know, objectifying people. I guess that's how it goes. Just stop objectifying people because that's going to be us someday. My body will die someday, very, you know, whatever. Hopefully and, not very. Right, very whatever. <laughs> um, who knows? But, you know, that's what we all face. That's our connection with each other. So this is making me think that, you know, one question to think about going forward would be, what if patients were involved before the courses were even designed? What if patients were asked, what should we do to innovate in medical education? So on that note, you're all visionaries. I want to ask you to talk a little bit about your visions for the future. Let's just say that the dean of your medical school will we'll focus on your, the institutions you're actually at for right now. They, they came to you and they said, you know what? What you're doing is fabulous. We love it. And you know, here's a blank check. Just please reinvent our medical curriculum. What would you like to see happening? Warren's laughing. Uh, <laughs> I guess that means I'm going first. Um, I guess if, if I had that, I would hire everyone here, and I had to hire Larry somehow. That seems to be the, the common piece that... Big salaries. Yeah, big salaries, and then we all go on vacation. Um, no, I, I think it's, 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 it's important that it actually becomes part of the curriculum. It's not, you know, a lot of this talk about, uh, about patience, and I remember when I gave a, a talk on digital professionalism, when I, when I told them we're going to talk about that next, you could hear the sigh, and like the... Uh, in the audience from people that are like, oh, we're gonna have another professionalism talk. Um, but it's not, it's sort of the soft skills. They wanna learn about mm -hmm. pathology. They wanna see gruesome pictures. They wanna go to the anatomy lab. They don't like wanna- cauliflower. Yeah, they don't, they don't wanna, they know they have to, but they don't wanna do it. Um, and it's sort of portrayed as it's sort of the, the fluff that comes around the medical curriculum. And I think if you had a chance to redesign a whole curriculum, that becomes a required piece that comes all the way through and it has a big part of it. And everyone assumes that it's, everyone knows it's going to be a big part and it's not just this marginalized piece of the curriculum. And I think that's a very big change that has to happen at a very high level. Um, but there's a lot of great examples of how this could work. So, Yeah, I guess I'll go next here. I think. Um, you know, what I do is really centered on public engagement and helping doctors understand public engagement. That's really a small piece of what a digital physician does. Um, there's mobile, there's quantified self, there's uh, a whole variety of other elements. And so if I would probably um, extrapolate what we're doing to all the things that we hear about here at Medicine X um, and so that we can build a more complete digital physician uh, beyond just communication in the public space. Uh, I'd probably center that on some of the new digital literacies that we're we're going to confront here in the new uh, in the new new era, and uh, uh, that's probably how I would shape it up. Um, I find myself thinking about the the role of the physician of the future. Um, right now, some academic physicians are expected to publish in peer-reviewed journals. Um, and the notion of blogging is not considered scholarly right. yet. Um, I would offer that if if all of our physicians expect it as a as a contribution to a digitally interconnected world to be contributing to that space, that that would be where I'd want to take it. For example, we have something like seventeen thousand new medical student graduates that become physicians every year in this country. If every medical school required each medical student to make a single Wikipedia edit, uh, we would very rapidly improve the quality of information available to the world. So uh, maybe bigger than just one medical school, but that's where I'd love to push it. It's a that's great, great vision. Kyra. That's powerful. <laughs> um, I would say a national curriculum that's required around patient engagement yeah. and knowing how to change behavior. 70% of all disease is driven off behavior. And so, or 70% of the cost, healthcare costs, is driven off of behavioral health kind of stuff, or health-related things. And so I think that it is time for providers to get these skills and to value these skills, and that is going to only uh, protect and uh, empower the provider community um, with its worth and its value in the whole industry. Um, and so I'd like to personally uh, improve upon the Engage and Empower Me course. I hope that in the near term, we get thousands and thousands and thousands and millions of people to take it. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, just, you know, really working collaboratively with our, our fellow allies in the field to make this vision happen. 
We heard from everyone, I think, that um, while you're doing amazing things, you're, you're carrying a lot of the weight of it yourself, really. So collaboration and collaboration across institutions is really going to be key. It may not be normative in medical education, but that's a transformation that's really going to have to happen. You know, Cara, this idea of a national curriculum, I think, is really important, and I think it's an it's a area where uh, MedEx Ed could play a, a real role in helping to define uh, and beyond what I do with, with public engagement, but with what does a doctor need to know about apps and smartphones and self-quant? Um, Again, no controversy. We are all sort of pushing <laughs> the know, grief. I know, we're waiting for controversy. Right, I'm going to try, to, I'm gonna try to, in to inject a little controversy. Okay. This is a question from Twitter, and after this we're going to open it up to audience questions. So if anyone out there has a question, you can come to the mics in the room. So here's a question. Some say that digital native is a myth, that that very concept is a myth. Do we need to talk about tech literacy? I think so. I mean, when our students come in and we sort of run through what topics they're interested in for our course, we cover some of the social media parts, we cover quantified self, 3D printing. Um, there's always a concern that, well, we're, we're teaching you about something that may be gone in a couple of years. But I think it's the, it's the process of looking at these new technologies, which is really important because, as Brian alluded to, a lot of them feel, yeah, you know, I, I, know, I have a device, I have multiple devices, I know how this works, why do I need to focus on this? But until you sort of have a way to evaluate new technologies, you'll be a private practitioner and someone's going to approach you with a device or a new solution, you need to be able to know if it works or if your patient comes with you, comes to you with something like that, you want to be able to assess it in some way. And so I think it's that, that construct that you need to have. Yeah, I think they're generally literate with regard to the tools that they have, but I think that problem comes when they when they confront the healthcare system which has its own construct with regard to privacy and professionalism. Um, Howard Rheingold here at Stanford calls uh, uh, literacy skill plus social competency. Mm. And so while the students may have that skill with regard to using a smartphone or texting or real-time communication, they don't have the social competency within the medical community. Uh -huh. I love that. I will start, start reusing the terminology because all of our students are, by definition, not a representative sample of the entire patient population they intend to serve. Absolutely. So our students are early adapters of technology or certainly very comfortable with them, by definition, having gotten to medical school. Um, but tech literacy is a much better term. Hmm. I, I see a heap pile of technology that goes unused in the space because mm -hmm. there's been mm -hmm. an assumption of if we build it, they will come. And I would like to see not the teaching of what technology there is or how to use it, but why it is used and why it operates the way it does. And even if you look at, you know, I have two teenage kids, and Snapchat for them, you know, has evolved in terms of I'm what they use that. it for. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for, no, e even in, in a year's time, it has gone from, you know, let's snap everybody, okay, we got bored yeah. with that, to now let's watch everybody's stories. And so there's an evolution of um, excitement. You know, there, there these, there's these curves of technology use that are you know, uh, preserved across whatever the new fad is. Why don't we get at the sort of DNA level of those so that we can teach what, what is really happening as at the social level or at the population level, and then the students can predict what's going to happen to newfangled X whatever, or they can look at app and say, no, nah, that's not going to work because people weren't going to do that. You know? So that's kind of what I would wish for. I, I am going to add that uh, we do make certain assumptions about um, these, the, this age group and these digital natives. And uh, Kirsten and I taught a course together at Rice University uh, called Medicine in the Age of Networked Intelligence. And one of the striking things working with college students or pre-meds was while they're quite comfortable with certain aspects of their technology, texting and using Facebook, there were certain things they really had no idea how, how to handle. Adding a hyperlink to a piece of online text. Um, I was sh absolutely shocked, um, mm. and these these students are also quite fearful of putting their putting their ideas out there beyond mm -hmm. text and Facebook. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. I think. Do we have a question over here? Uh, hi, my name is Kelly Grindrod. I'm an, a pharmacy professor at the University of Waterloo in Canada, uh, and I also teach social media to my students and consumer health informatics. Um, now, something interesting we've done, which I'm curious what your thoughts are on this, is in Canada we have a, a federally funded group called Canada Health InfoWay. And they funded the, all the schools of pharmacy to get together and build an online uh, con health informatics module that could in any way be inserted into our curriculum. Mm -hmm. And we just happen to be the first out of the gate, but they've also funded the medical schools and the nursing schools to create similar programs. 
So that was one component. The first batch of funding was to create the modules. So I wrote the consumer health informatics module, for example. Um, we had uh, virtual patients and whatnot in, um, created for that as well. The next stage of funding, though, was actually implementation into the curriculum. So we had a meeting two weeks ago where all the faculties of pharmacy got together, we got together in Montreal, and we brainstormed all the ways we could take what was already existing and insert it into our curriculum. So I have a consumer health informatics course at my disposal. Easily, I just insert it there. But for a lot of schools, they'd never thought about this before, so if they're teaching documentation, there's actually an online documentation module that can be inserted there. Or if we're talking about security and privacy, there might be a professionalism course that can be inserted there. So I'm curious what your thoughts are. The US is a much bigger country than, than uh, little old Canada. Um, but if you think that that's something feasible, perhaps here. I think for, for me personally, um, the evolution of the role of faculty at institutions, I would say this, this is all the way down, not just at the medical school level, but any kind of curriculum. Um, I don't know that we should be in the business of content creation anymore. We should be in the business of content curation because each institution now has access to all the world's information at all times. Our learners have access to so much. In fact, they can look up things faster than we can answer, ask the question. So I think what, what, what may happen is that schools start deciding what network connections do we intend to make with which other schools so that way if Brian already has this fabulous course uh, at Baylor, then why should we reinvent the wheel? Let's have consortia of students in consortia of medical schools. That would be my projection just thinking out loud with you. Yeah, I think we're going to see the online space really heat up in medical education. I think it's probably, if you, you know, envision as a landscape, um, just like there were textbooks in the 20th century, people are going to take on certain pieces and they're going to become experts. And you've got a guy who does an amazing head and neck dissection. And, and why should every medical school be doing that, right? Why not just have a federation of online content and then, say, and then you say, well, what, what's medical school for? Well, we bring everybody together and we bring the patient in and make a, you know, in-person experience, right? <laughs> Don't you think this would require a pretty major paradigm shift in the ways that medical school Precisely. leadership thinks yes. about its own branding? Right. Well, yes, and I mean, this is an example where none of us were hostile towards one another coming we up here to talk about four <laughs> different med schools. <laughs> yep. um, so yes, I think it takes a paradigm shift where each institution is used to being it, its own ship. On the other hand, education is changing. The information mm -hmm. technology around us is forcing education to be disrupted. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I, I couldn't agree more with Brian about the notion that maybe the content will be disseminated, but the patients are at each institution. And so our, our students are going to want to be in the room with the patients. So that part isn't going away anytime soon. Mm -hmm. yep. On that note, uh, another question we have from Twitter. How about hiring patients to be equal partners in the design of the course? Absolutely. 100%. News happened yesterday. I, uh, I have to put my money where my mouth is. Our course is on Wikipedia rather than behind a course firewall or mm -hmm. something like that. So I would love e-patients to sort of contribute to the talk page and help me make it better. Mm -hmm. So we're always looking for great cases um, to present to our, uh, our students for discussion, and I think that's a great idea. And I think the patients see it from a totally different view, and it might be very interesting to pose it as a, as a position view of approaching a doctor online. We always look from the doctor's point of view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would I would add that it's not just a different view. It's like there there's there's interstitial uh, experience that isn't even being recorded or reported out. You know, there's just the you know us talking what to our interstitial that like you know in, in between. Term. Sorry, <laughs> it was just it was just my analogist mind going okay. on. Um, but you know the connective tissue between visits has, is complete black box mm -hmm. in clinical medicine because it's always been focused on the acute visit, and so you know all of that is mystery, medical mystery. Um, experience mystery, uh, side effect mystery, all of that stuff, um, you know, because we, we know that, you know, phase two, phase three clinical trials do not uncover all side effects. And, and there's like, you know, yeah. a billion drugs being produced every year. And, and so, you know, the patient body, the collective knowledge, uh, crowdsourcing that is, you know, Patients medicine. Like me. that, that is medicine as, as the future. Any, any question, another question from the audience? Yes. Hi, I'm Amanda. I am a fourth year medical student at a medical school. So I, first of all, <laughs> applaud you for, uh, <laughs> for um, integrating digital medicine into your curricula, um, especially since at my medical school, I, I've been pushing it. And one of my research um, interests has been looking into social media policies at US medical schools. Um, 
following uh, Dr. Terry Kine's paper showing that only 10% of medical schools had a policy geared towards social media or um, your online presence in 2010, and as I've found, um, that slightly more than half now have a policy. So there is this push towards, oh, okay, maybe we should pay more attention to social media and digital medicine in general. But what surprised me was that some of the policies I read specifically said you shouldn't have a presence. Um, and as a fourth year applying now to residencies, you know, I, I see a lot of my colleagues already changing their names on Facebook, deleting their Twitter accounts, suddenly trying to, you know, dissolve their digital footprint as best as possible. Um, and pre-meds do the same thing too. So I think I, I was just curious as to what you guys have seen and what if, you know, you, your curricula have come at ends or at odds with um, the policies at your institutions. Uh, I'm just going to start by saying that um, one of the things that drives me crazy is we're trying to teach uh, future physicians how to engage with the public using policies. Okay, policies, in my experience, as someone who's been involved in constructing them and having lived with them, really do a better job of serving institutions than they do serving patients and physicians. Mm -hmm. So we, we need to be training doctors how to use these tools constructively and usefully. Policies don't do that. Policies set <coughs> boundaries, and most of them don't even do a good job of that. I mean, a lot of these uh, national organizations have put together policy statements. You can't even find the people who write them have never used these tools. And so. Right. And I think it's a matter of just building the context for how it works. I mean, it's, we, we have, I've, I've seen lots of different policies from institutions that are very restrictive. You can't mention work. You can't mention school. You might as well not be online. But to really think that that, you know, seven minutes a year you have as a student or physician is going to be the only way you can impact a patient's health is ridiculous. So you need to be able to engage outside of the office and have those things. But I think the people that oftentimes make these policies don't see the larger picture. They don't get the context of this. And it's a big challenge. Um, you know, for your question specifically about just sort of being a fourth year student, um, we had a great student that went into family medicine that pretty much his whole progression from third and fourth year was very heavily into social media. And family medicine is a great specialty that's very active in social media. And that kind of defined how he went through the whole application process. So there are ways to leverage it depending on your specialty of choice. You know, pediatrics is, is very involved in social media. Emergency medicine's getting there a little bit. Um, well, they're pretty, they're pretty, pretty yeah, we're, we're, get, we're getting there. We're a little bit behind you guys. But, um, but uh, you know, to, to stop and delete accounts, I think, is going definitely the wrong way. Um, and you'll find a lot of people that are very active in social media as physicians that would be more than happy to, to back you up on that. So. Mm. so we are out of time, but I just want to say I think a lot of really interesting lessons learned and visions for the future have surfaced in this conversation. And I'm really excited to see how all of this builds as the MedEx Ed project evolves over the next year. So thank you all so much for doing the hard work that you are doing in this space. Thank you all to the audience as well. Thank you. Thank you.